Okay. Share on the page. Okay, and welcome to our Exploring A Course in Miracles live podcast recording. I'm Emily Bennington with the Circle of Atonement, and I'm here with Circle founder Robert Perry. And today we are talking about the Course's teachings on boundaries. Boundaries is obviously a topic that is everywhere these days. And a few weeks ago, Robert and I were talking about what the Course would have to say on it. And to be honest with you, we didn't know. Uh, There's no direct teaching in the course on boundaries. There's not a text section on it. There's not a workbook lesson on it. And so we decided to host a workshop on boundaries in part to answer this question for ourselves. And so Robert went through the course. He went through the cameo essays in the back of the complete and annotated edition of the course. He went through part of Helen Shuckman's autobiography and in the end came up with a composite that gives us a much clearer picture of the course's view on boundaries. And it's, it's absolutely beautiful. We did end up doing a whole three hour workshop on this yesterday. And I feel like we need three days to really take it in, <laughs> uh, in yeah. part because the, the course's teachings on boundaries, as, as we were saying yesterday, are so wildly different than what we're accustomed to hearing out there. It's just a completely different approach. And we'll get into more of that today. What we thought that we would do is a a, a mini version of our workshop. In yesterday's workshop, we shared seven stories where Jesus speaks directly to the, the issue of boundaries. And so we're going to share four of those stories today. We're going to share one story where you try to help someone and the situation gets messy. We're going to share a story where you try and correct someone without embarrassment or hostility. We are going to share a a story and a teaching around when you can't hold yourself back from complying with other people's urgent requests for help. This is a very serious boundary issue for a lot of us. And also a story around when you keep accepting mistreatment and can't seem to express how hurt you feel. So Robert, before we kind of dive in, is there anything that you want to say to frame us on the topic of boundaries? Well, just that the beauty of these stories is these are places where Jesus weighed in on either a very specific situation in someone's life or a familiar kind of situation that we all face. And and they're stories about boundary issues, as we would say today. And so there's literally no ambiguity whatsoever in terms of what he is driving at on this topic. And I really like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny because as I was saying in, in just a moment ago, we didn't know what the course was going to say on boundaries because, again, there's no direct teaching. But when you put these stories together, the picture becomes really clear. And you're right. There is no ambiguity here. He has a very particular approach to this topic. Yeah. So what we thought we would do just briefly to begin is before we get into the course's teachings on on boundaries we would share very briefly what's out there in the conventional wisdom on the topic and and a very simple definition of boundaries that i found online is that they are the limits we set with other people that indicate what we find acceptable and unacceptable in their behavior towards us. And boundaries is a topic that, again, is everywhere now, but that wasn't always the case. We didn't really start talking about boundaries all that much until the 1980s when the personal transformation personal transformation movement really started to gain traction. And so this 
this cultural shift towards boundaries is really the byproduct of our cultural shift towards self-help. And so boundaries is a, a concept that was popularized with, by self-help authors, our increasing interest in therapy that also happened in the 70s and the 80s and support groups around this topic. So yesterday in the workshop, one thing that I did was this, this composite, the synopsis of the, the teachings that are out there on boundaries. And I'll, I'll just very briefly go over the main three points. And Robert, please feel free to jump in on, on any of these as well. So uh, there's a ton that you could say on this topic, but, but three main points. Boundaries are essential to self-care. Conventional wisdom is that they are normal, they are necessary, they are healthy. We are told that we need to stop deriving our feelings of self-worth from pleasing others and start standing up for our own needs and desires. This is where the concept of boundaries originally came from. You want to say anything? Well, what I would say is that uh, you're talking about this being a condensed summary, but what you quickly find out as you look into this topic is everyone's saying roughly the same thing. It boils down to some very, very simple points. Yeah. So first and foremost, boundaries are healthy. They're necessary. They're, they're required for your own peace and self-respect. That's what you hear out there. Number two, boundaries um, to... To maintain boundaries, you have to be assertive. We hear all the time, clear is kind. You have to be very direct with others so that they know what behaviors you will and will not accept. Um, we're told that this is going to be uncomfortable because no one likes to feel like they're being mean, but establishing clear boundaries is best for you and the other person in the long run. They are clear. Uh, they are confused about where you stand and you save yourself the frustration of, of them repeatedly coming and, and violating the, the boundaries if you're not clear. So what we are told is that setting boundaries and being assertive in the way in which you express them with others means that you value yourself, you value your needs and your feelings more than the thoughts and the opinions and the feelings of other people. And that is something to, to celebrate. Yeah, and that was, it was surprised me just how much it's openly said, you, know, you have to put yourself first. Your big mistake is putting their needs before your own. And I remember back in the 80s when a book came out called Looking Out for Number One, and it got a lot of news because it was like shockingly open in the idea of self first. And mm -hmm. nowadays, it's not shocking. It's just expected. That's what you're supposed to, to say and to hear. Yeah, a book like that wouldn't be shocking at all. It would just tuck neatly into all <laughs> the other self yeah. teachings that we hear these days. So one thing that I'll say on this as well is when we did the workshop yesterday and I was sharing these three points, I also shared quotes from just what's out there on boundaries. And on this one, an author that I could say the name we would all know said something along the line of, you don't need to spend your time and energy hustling and for people who don't matter. And trying and to win over. Trying to win over the people who don't matter. And I, and I was just thinking, my God, what? Can you ever imagine the course ever saying, don't spend your energy on someone else because they don't matter? I mean, it's just completely antithetical to, to, to the teachings of the course. So conventional views on boundaries, they're essential to self-care. You have to be assertive about establishing them. And the third and final one that we'll point out today is if the other person doesn't respect your boundaries, then you don't actually owe them anything. You've told them what you need, what you need. You've repeated your request. And if the other person doesn't respect that, then you are free to cut them out of your life and ignore their outreach and their messages. The idea is that no one has the right to make you feel uncomfortable and no is a complete sentence. Now, this is something that we're seeing today. This is an epidemic of chucking people out of 
our life. Um, and so is that the direct result of the popularity of boundaries? Who knows, but we see it everywhere. It's probably related because I mean, I'm sure since the dawn of time, people have, you know, you just naturally let people go, you know, you sort of move on. But nowadays it's more than just, you know, we had a conflict and now we're distancing ourselves from each other. It's like a victory for, for yourself, for your ability to love yourself, for, um, you know, your mental health. And it's done with a great deal, I think, more pride than it used to be done with. Yeah, and, and what we were talking about yesterday was that the origin of the separation, the, the very thing that got us into this mess that we're in with our toxic relationships and, and our egocentricity began with rejection. And so what we think we're going to get from boundaries is some sense of, of healing and peace, but we're trying to use the tool that got us into the mess to fix the mess. And so what I really appreciate about the course's teachings, and I know we need to get into it, is that the focus isn't so much on establishing your territory so that you can maintain the peace behind your fence. It's healing and outreach to the other person so that the relationship stays intact, even if you're going through a difficult time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as I'm thinking, well, as you're talking, I'm just thinking about a couple of sections in the text that really address this idea of having a wall around our lives in which we try to, you know, that that's there to keep out the bad people. Um, there's a couple of sections that discuss this at length, and they just have a very different view than we would expect on the whole topic. Yeah, and that's where, yeah, I know we'll, we'll get into the teaching in just a second, but that's where in the research on boundaries, one thing that you see is that it's very often portrayed as a spiritual virtue. And I can't imagine any serious spiritual path leading us to a place where we just completely throw people out of our life and, and focus on putting up walls around ourselves to maintain our inner peace that way. And so it's what I love about the course based approach is that it's, it's, it's far more loving. So you want to get into the first example? Yeah, I guess what I'll say before I do is that in these stories, there is an acknowledgement of, of a need to set boundaries at times, but the whole philosophical framework on which it rests and therefore the whole feeling of it is so completely different. There's not this sense that we're these vulnerable creatures and we're constantly faced with these threats from other people that we have to protect ourselves from. And doing that is this victory for self-love. It's a whole different framework. So even though, I mean, you can't, you can't deny the need for boundaries at times, it's, it's, it's impossible, but is it, do we look at it the way in which it's framed in contemporary discourse? Okay, so the first story uh, that we'll talk about is about Helen, Helen Chuckman, obviously, and Mike, a little known story that is included in one of the cameos in the back of the CE. And there's two parts to this. One is that First, Helen received guidance from Jesus about what to do about Mike. And the Mike thing, it'll get clear as we go on. So first of all, Jesus said to Helen and Bill, when you and Bill are ready to ask the Holy Spirit together what you can do for Mike, he will tell you if you make no attempt to give the answer for him. He says, prejudge his answer not. Then he says, the Holy Spirit will never teach you to disrupt communication. Quite a statement. He'll never teach you to basically cut off communication. But be wholly willing to let him maintain it in his way, suggesting he might have some 
creative novel way of maintaining communication that is not what you would expect. Mike is unhappy and afraid because he thinks communication through the body can be sought and found. It is no harder for the Holy Spirit to teach him that communication is of the mind and not the body than it is for him to teach it to you. So Mike, we don't know a lot about Mike here, but he thinks communication is done through the body. And this guidance was received right next to a section that talks about communication, thinking communication is of the body and identifying that with sexuality. Mike so, had a crush on Helen. Yes, we were building up to that, but we should just say it. Mike, <laughs> Mike had feelings for Helen. Um, we only have an hour. <laughs> But the guidance says, don't cut off communication with him, rather seek the Holy Spirit's guidance about this, let him maintain communication in his way, and that way Mike will learn that communication is of the mind, not the body. So that's the first part of the Mike story. It's, just not, it's kind of vague. And then three months later, in Helen's notebooks and in the Urtext, there is this letter that doesn't have an opening or closing that is written to Mike, and it's, it's obviously written to Mike. Uh, it seems like this is the guidance that Jesus was telling them to get from the Holy Spirit because it's so lofty and loving and it does do that thing of, main, it, it doesn't cut off communication, but it maintains it in a particular way. So the letter is quite long. I'm just going to read bits of it, but it is an extraordinary letter. And for those who have the complete and annotated edition of A Course in Miracles from the circle, what cameo is Mike? It's I I want to say it's 24 or 25. Okay. I'm All gonna right. say it's 24, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Okay, well, you could, the point is, in the back of the CE, you can read the full letter from yeah. Helen to Mike, and you should. It's beautiful. It's really quite extraordinary. Okay, I'm just going to read key bits from it. So she says, the progress, Mike's in therapy. She says, the progress you are so evidently making in analysis is especially good news, and I'm sure it will continue. Then she says, I do suggest and offer the suggestion with all the friendship and sympathy in which I know it will be received that whatever illusions may surround our relationship are not helpful to you and may well constitute a detour along the road to the more mature relationship you want. I would suggest, and here comes the key part, in deepest friendship that you make every effort to work through your feelings for me he's developed feelings for Helen, with your therapist, and that we keep in touch, of course, but do not meet again, meaning do not meet in person again, until you are ready to see our relationship without illusions that must delay your progress toward increasing reality. Real friendships, such as we both want, are not attained through the pursuit of illusory goals. Then she says, and when we do meet again, let it be on a realistic basis, when you can meet without illusions, which can only hold us back from more mature and really satisfying relationships. And finally, she says, please do this, Mike. You will be glad you did. This will work out well, Mike, but now is the time to bring your problems as openly and directly as possible into your therapy and really see them through. You have already made too much progress to be really willing to tolerate delay now. So just to kind of summarize it all, Helen does say that she had been serving in some kind of therapeutic capacity with Mike. I don't know if it was formal or informal, but he's in therapy elsewhere now, making what she keeps saying is a lot of progress toward entering into mature relationships based on moving away from illusions and into increasing reality. Mike has developed feelings for Helen, and she is saying these feelings are the very kind of illusions that he is trying to progress past 
so he can move into real, mature, and satisfying relationships. So she's saying that his feelings are basically an unconscious way of delaying progress in his therapy, and therefore she puts up this boundary. She affirms the relationship, calls it a friendship many times, um, but within the relationship, she puts up a limited temporary boundary that until he works his feelings through for her, they should not meet in person. And what I find so striking about this is that she sets the boundary and it's not chuck him out of her life, right? She makes it so clear how much love and care she has for him. She sets the boundary, but does so for the sake of his progress, not her protection. And that's the kind of thing that as I explored boundaries out there online, I didn't see anything like that. Oh yeah. Everything that you read about boundaries online, really without exception, is about your protection. The boundary right. is there to protect you from the unacceptable behavior of the other person. And if you take the Mike story, yeah, it's, it's unacceptable from Helen's point of view that he has these feelings for her, who knows the way in which he was acting on them. But her response to it is a template for how to set a clear boundary. She says, I don't think we should meet, but she does it with such care and kindness towards him. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes that letter stand out. Yeah, I mean, she basically frames his whole effort right now as using therapy to move into more mature and satisfying relationships that are without illusions. And then she says that his feelings toward her threatened that very goal. And what it makes me think is, you know, who hasn't experienced unrequited love where you fall for somebody and your feelings aren't returned? Wouldn't it be an amazing blessing to fall for someone like Helen and have the response be that? Because generally- it would make me fall in love with them even more. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, generally your feelings are this unwanted intrusion. Right. Right? And to, and to have that incredibly loving response that's all about concern for you right would be amazing yeah and you would think i mean that would be the best experience of unrequited love you could have i know there's something just well we've already said it but it's just beautiful and i i can totally see myself like if i were mike i'd be like now i love you even more <laughs> <laughs> but one thing that that we talked about yesterday you had said that there's a, the teaching in the course the holy spirit would never I forget how it goes advise you to disrupt communication well and that's what was that's not in the course that's that was said privately to helen and bill about mike well but it does it's, it's stated as a blanket principle it's a juicy line can you say it again yeah. The Holy Spirit will never teach you to disrupt communication, but be wholly willing to let him maintain it in his way. Now, this is the thing that, that got some attention yesterday because the, mm -hmm. we all have those relationships where we know it's unhealthy, if not toxic, if not abusive. And, and so how are we to balance this teaching of, not disrupting communication with knowing that there are people that we actually can't talk to. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we should take this principle and say, well, I've got to stay in constant communication with those people. But my conviction is that if we really were to open up a clear pipeline of the Holy Spirit and get his guidance on the issue, he would find some creative way to not just completely reject the person and not engage in communication that could suck you into or keep you in something that's really destructive for, for both people. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
And you know, who knows what that could be? Someone in, in the workshop yesterday talked about um, just talking to that person telepathically, which I thought was a really creative solution. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say that we had three different scenarios. One was, it was so clear that the participant needed to not have contact with, with the person who was violating the boundaries for now. But then it there seemed was, genuinely dangerous. Yes. And then there was one where she came to the realization that she could keep this person's picture in her home and to send, I forget it was a man, him or her love in her mind. So there was some openness to, to reestablishing communication at some point. And then there was another scenario, I believe, where the person was thinking that that they wanted to cut someone off and then realized, no, that's not a good idea because I'm overreacting to this. Like they realized it was on them and not the other person. And so it's it's situational, isn't it? It is. It is. But I think what we need to do is kind of pull our mind to a more impartial place and look objectively at the current propensity that you were talking about of, of victoriously chucking people out of our lives because the course has a whole pattern of teaching on this. It talks about, there are about half a dozen passages about disruption of communication, always associated with that being the ego's goal um, and the goal that it has for all kinds of things like language and like guilt. It wants to use everything to disrupt communication. Um, it talks about the, the desire to get rid of your brother and equates that with hate and says that, you know, we are prone to, um, rather than getting rid of the hate, getting rid of our brother and keeping the hate as if it's our real friend. Yeah. <laughs> this is so why we're not going to get through four. Examples. We're going to do it. We're going to move on. We're going to do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we should, we should, yeah, we should forge ahead. I know we're both kind of being indulgent here, <laughs> but it is really really rich wisdom. I think for me, the thing about Helen is that she sets the boundary, but does it with such love and concern for him. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty the whole, of that. The whole progress, not protection. So how often do we set boundaries thinking about the progress of the other person versus our own self-protection. I know we've yeah. already said that, but it's just a point that's worth repeating because so much of the conversation around boundaries is self-protective. It's all about that. I mean, this, the, in what I sampled, you know, I went to websites, watched YouTube videos, listened to summaries of boundary books. All of it was about that. Yeah, okay. We, we've, we're not okay. gonna get through all that. So the next story is about Mrs. Albert, this is all also is in a cameo in the back of the CE, cameo nine. And the story is that Helen runs into Mrs. Albert at the bedside of Dave Diamond, who's dying. So Mrs. Albert apparently knows him, Helen knows him. And Jesus speaks very highly of Mrs. Albert, more highly than anyone I can think of that he mentions. And he goes into this discourse about Helen gets people's names wrong because she identifies the person with the name and she thinks if she gets their name wrong, the hate in her mind can't find the person. Um, and so she has this kind of neurotic propensity to get people's names wrong, even when she really knows better. And then she gets Mrs. Albert's name wrong and finds that Mrs. Albert has a totally different relationship with names, she doesn't identify the name with the person. So I've just cut a little bit out of a relatively long discourse, but here's what it says. Returning to Mrs. Albert, not Andrews, so signaling that Helen has gotten her name wrong, she corrected your error about her name without embarrassment and without hostility because she has not made your own mistake about names. She is not afraid because she knows she is protected. And in light of the whole boundaries discussion, that, took on, that line took on great significance. She made the correction only because you were inaccurate. And the whole question of embarrassment did not occur to her. 
just a few sentences there, but so much is said. So let me try to summarize what I get from those sentences. First of all, I think the whole basis for her behavior is she has this rock-like sense of security. We, we read Jesus saying um, she is not afraid because she knows she is protected. Earlier, he said she is working miracles every day because she knows who she is. So she knows who she is. She knows she's protected. She feels the security and lack of fear that I think is very unusual. And you mean, no, and well, Jesus means knows who she is as a child of God. And she's protected right. because she's not leaning on anything but him. She knows purpose. that God is her protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so she doesn't identify with something superficial and flimsy like a name. Okay, she's she's rooted in some kind of confidence in her own being. And so when her name's mistreated, she doesn't think, oh, I'm being mistreated, which we all tend to do. And so out of that security, she can respond without hostility, meaning aggressively asserting her correct name, because she doesn't feel any sense of threat in the situation. It also means she can respond without embarrassment, feeling shy about correcting the error because her sense of wholeness leaves her without embarrassment. Jesus says embarrassment is a form of fear. And he says she is not afraid because she knows she's protected. She just corrects the name purely as a matter of factual accuracy, not as a, hey, that's me, you're, you're getting wrong. Um, and again, he says the whole question of embarrassment did not occur to her. And so, again, like with Helen and Mike, she's doing this correction, which could be seen as a kind of boundary setting. She's saying, don't get my name wrong. Um, but again, it's not for self-protection because she already knows she's protected. And she's, she's also free of the usual embarrassment. The, I mean, the, all these boundary things talk about how when you set the boundary, you'll be afraid. It'll be difficult. Basically, you'll be embarrassed to do it. And she didn't have that. She just, in her security, she could do it as a completely neutral thing that had nothing to do with her because she was already taken care of. And Im imagine dealing with our boundary issues in that way. Yeah, well, it's one of those things where you listen to a story about Mrs. Albert and you think, well, okay, Helen got her name wrong. That's not such a big deal. I'm going through something far bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, what makes the story about Mrs. Albert so interesting is that so often we put our identity in our name and we put our identity in all of these other things too. We put our identity in our relationships. That's where we tend to set a lot of boundaries. We put our identity in our status. And so we set boundaries around things related to our work and our career. We, our time. Our time, yeah. We put our identity in the things that we have. And so we set boundaries around, around that. And so even though the example with Mrs. Albert is about a name, which seems kind of trivial and superficial, the concept here uh, it applies to anything that you set a boundary around. If your identity is in that relationship and that's why you're setting all these boundaries around it, then that's the thing to look at because the reason why Mrs. Albert was able to go through this situation in a way that Jesus praises so highly is because she found that transformative way, neither embarrassed. She, she didn't just not say anything at all mm -hmm. when Helen got her name wrong, which would be the temptation. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't hostile about it either. And so yesterday in the workshop, we did an exercise for all of these stories. And, and one of the things that you and I both came to in the exercise on the Mrs. Albert story is that we can express boundaries just declaratively and kindly. But what I know I'm doing, and, and you'd mentioned that you were doing this as well, although I don't think you do it as much as I do, is, is put a bunch of meaning on top of the boundaries that we set. 
So right. we can strip that away and not be so hostile and not be so emotional about the boundaries that we set. And that's the Mrs. Albert way. Like she just, the reason why she's so beloved in the circle is because she goes through life differently and we're all aspiring to that, aren't we? Yeah. And there was another, the main thing Jesus focused on and praised her for was this other thing where she just, she spoke up about her convictions relative to the power of spiritual healing um, without checking with Helen first to, to see if Helen was going to agree. And there again, she exhibited that, that lack of embarrassment and, and complete sense of security in herself that I think we would all love to have. Now, I want to be Mrs. Albert when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next one. Next one, we're getting there. The next one is about Edgar Casey, the famous American psychic. And, and we're, we had subtitled this, when you can't hold yourself back from complying with urgent requests for help. So what happened with Casey, he would give these readings twice a day for people who wrote in with requests, mostly for health issues. Uh, and then in the last few years of his life, he got very famous and he would often get 1500 requests for readings a day. And many of them from people with serious conditions, some from dying children, and he just felt he had to do as many readings as possible. And so he would do it many times the two per day that he was supposed to do. And what happened was it was a strain on his physical system. He, his health basically collapsed. And within a few months, um, he took a rest, but it, it, didn't, it didn't help. And within a few months, he died at the relatively young age of 67. And so he felt he had, for the sake of the people, of the need that was out there, he had to stretch and stretch. But Jesus had a different perspective. And there's guidance that he gives that's part of chapter one. We've kept it in the CE, just lightly edited, so it's not specifically about Casey anymore. And here's how it originally read. One of the major problems with miracle workers is that they are so sure that what they are doing is right because they know it stems from love, that they do not pause to let me establish my limits. And since boundaries are about establishing limits, this really seemed interesting. Okay, it continues. Well, what he, Casey, did came from me. He could not be induced to ask me each time whether I wanted him to perform this particular miracle, meaning do this particular reading. If he had, he would not have performed any miracles that could not get through constructively and would thus have saved himself unnecessary strain. He burned himself out with indiscriminate miracles and to this extent did not fulfill his own full purpose. Meaning like if he had lived 20 more years, who knows how many more people he could have helped. The answer is never perform a miracle without asking me if you should. This spares you from exhaustion. So the basic idea is pretty obvious that he's, he's not saying Casey didn't set limits. He's saying, I wanted to set limits for Casey and he didn't let me, he didn't ask me, should I do this one? Should I do this one? As a result, Oh, and what Jesus would have had him do is only those readings where the, the information from the reading would have gotten through and really helped that person. Where the person was really open to it, would, would apply it and so on. Um, and therefore, Casey, since he didn't do that, he died at a relatively young age. And then in chapter three, later on, there's a, quite a long discourse about Casey which we have in Cameo 15 in the CE. There's a couple of things I wanna draw out from that. What he does there is he, he links it with the word sacrifice and a mindset that he says is behind sacrifice. Okay, here's one piece of guidance. It is obvious that Casey himself was not able to transcend the misperceptions of the need for sacrifice or he could not possibly have been willing to sacrifice himself. Anyone who was unable to leave the requests of others unanswered 
has not entirely transcended egocentricity. I never, quote, gave of myself in this inappropriate way, so Jesus didn't do this, nor would I have ever encouraged Casey to do so. So he's saying that Casey never could understand that it wasn't his job to sacrifice. And that, that had something to do with egocentricity. He, if Jesus had said, don't do readings for this person, this person, this person, this person, Casey should have been able to say, okay, that's fine. But there was some, according to this passage, egocentricity in him that couldn't say that. And so one last passage says what did hamper him was a profound sense of personal unworthiness, which characteristically enough was sometimes overcompensated for in what might be called a Christian form of grandiosity. Now near this very passage, he talks about Christians being too willing to sacrifice themselves. Um, so I'm sure what that means is that Casey, of course, as it says, had this profound sense of personal unworthiness. And then he tried to compensate for that through heroic self-sacrifice. I think that's what he means by a Christian form of grandiosity. It's like your grandiosity is look how humbly I'm serving everyone and pouring myself out for everyone. And as a result, this left him vulnerable to burning himself out, which he did. So on the one side, we have what Casey should have done in asking and letting Jesus set his limits. On the other side, we have the mindset that presumably kept him from doing that. The mindset that said, I can make up for my unworthiness through heroic self-sacrifice. There's a lot there. There's um, a lot there. Yeah, I, the, but just to give a brief summary of what's going on here with Edgar Casey, and again, I want to make sure that anyone who's listening can understand the ways in which this applies to all of us. If you're feeling like you are put upon to the point where other people are violating your boundaries related to time and energy and whatnot, Casey is a good example because the, the, his story is, and, and again, I can absolutely, I think we can see all see ourselves in this. There's some sense of unworthiness in him that makes him want to do these heroic things to outperform, to overperform, to, to work himself too much. Mm -hmm. And he's not asking whether the work that he's doing is the best use of his time, whether what he's doing is going to get through constructively to those who need his help. And as a result of working so much, he burned himself out and died relatively young. And so I think what we tend to do, it is, again, there's just so much there as well. Like there's mm -hmm. the, the overcompensating for the lack of self-worth, there's that. There's the feeling like, well, what we're doing is so noble and so good that, that we have to do it or no one else will. And so we keep working. And then there's the not asking about what's going to get through constructively. And then there's the burning ourselves out. So yeah. there's a lot to pick up on there. There is, and I just want to balance all that out because we had somebody in the workshop say, how would Jesus call what he did Miracles, which Jesus does repeatedly, as he calls his readings miracles, if that was the mindset behind it. And we have to really affirm that Jesus says what he did came from love, what he did came from me, meaning Jesus. Um, he talks about approvingly about his genuine desire to help. He says um, that he says that he had respect for Casey's great efforts on my behalf, mm -hmm. meaning Jesus's. So Casey is coming from a loving place with Jesus's approval behind him. But what makes him unable to ask those questions you talked about, is this the best use of my time? Shouldn't I be asking Jesus which readings to do, which ones not to do? 
what makes him unable to do that is the presence in all of that sincerity and, and desire to help of that other mindset, which Jesus calls egocentricity. It's about Casey. Not yes. the other person. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. I know for him, it was about the other person. I was a real Casey student for years. But at the same time, Jesus is saying there was an infection in there, right? Where Casey's thinking it's also about him. He gets to prove his worth. And how often do we feel like we've got something to prove? It comes from a sense of unworthiness or it comes from a wanting to like an a, a inappropriate attachment of identity to something else, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where the Mrs. Albert story kind of ties in because Casey didn't know his own worth. He didn't know who he was and that he was protected. And so he was putting his worth on something else and that was causing him to work too hard and to burn himself out. And so from the standpoint of what can we learn here related to boundaries, number one, you don't have to run yourself ragged. Like that's, that's not the point. Two right. is, is asking Jesus what you should do. And, and we talked about this a bit yesterday too. If you're someone who's thinking, well, I could ask, but I'm not going to hear anything. We always hear that it, it, and that's a muscle guidance is a muscle that can build. And so I we think, just have to keep asking. Yeah. I mean, I don't hear every time I ask, but in my experience, everyone hears some. Yeah. So and you not might not asking? hear hear clear as clearly as Helen, but we all, when we ask, and if you ask enough, you start to get a sense. Yeah. And, and so, so are we not asking because we don't hear or because we don't want to give up control? Well, yeah, because I'm sure there's some people who are like, well, Jesus telling me what to do all the time is a violation of my time boundaries. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> and so Jesus is violating a boundary there, you know, back <laughs> off Christ. Uh, so so from from that standpoint, what would you what would you say about Jesus violating boundaries? Yeah, of somebody who's like, well, hold on, that that seems like intrusive on his part. Well, I think you know, like, why cut off your nose to spite your face? If someone is there who will give you much better advice than you can give yourself, you're stupid and what not will work, it. and what will work, and mm -hmm. what will. I mean, Casey could have saved years. Right. Yeah, because this is actually a matter of life and death. It's a Casey matter of life could and death. have lived longer than he did. Yeah. But yeah. for and the fact that he burned himself out. Exactly. And for me, one of the big takeaways here is it's I shouldn't think it's my business to set limits. I should think it's my business to let Jesus establish his limits for me. He knows what my limits are better than I do, why not let, and, and then it's like, I'm not the bad guy. I'm not gonna say to everyone, hey, you know, this is not me establishing this limit, it's Jesus, so suck it, you know, but, <laughs> but I can, far. yeah, I can know in my mind that I'm really just following his will here. He's establishing his limits for me and that would make a difference. Yeah. I'm wondering how much we should tell people that though. That seems some, like something- I don't something, think we should tell them that because that's- that's, a, that's not that something can, you say it's kind to of a other weapon. people. Yeah. Yeah, but, but know it in your own mind. And that does relieve that sense of, you know, oh, I don't want to set this boundary. Yeah. You can know in your heart that you feel it's your guidance while right. at the same time communicating that in a Mrs. Albert kind of way to the other person. You, I just think it feels, to, it feels wrong to me in, in some sense, instances to say to the other person, well, Jesus is telling me to do this. I can only imagine. Oh, yeah. We that throw that be. around as course students all too freely. Yeah, I know. I've heard some wild things that, that students are quote unquote guided to do. And if, yeah. it, it feels like if you say I was guided to do it, you can get away with it. But should really kind of check that. Okay, so okay. We, we've got 10 minutes. Can we've we got time. The, okay. We can do it. So the last one is from the Song of Prayer, the, the section on forgiveness to destroy. And it's an, in a series of four examples of what he calls forgiveness to destroy. And this one's the martyr, okay? So he talks about, quote, those who seek the role of martyr 
at another's hand. Here must the aim be clearly seen, for this may pass as meekness and as charity instead of cruelty. Is it not kind to be accepting of another's spite and not respond except with silence and a gentle smile? Behold, how good are you who bear with patience and with saintliness the anger and the hurt another gives and do not show the bitter pain you feel. Forgiveness to destroy will often hide behind a cloak like this. It shows the face of suffering and pain in silent proof of guilt and of the ravages of sin. Is this love or is it rather treachery to one who needs salvation from the pain of guilt? And that's the other person. So the basic idea here is that as the martyr, you endure all this unfair treatment while trying to conceal the hurt you feel, although you silently show what he calls the face of suffering and pain. So you don't conceal it entirely, um, but you don't vocalize it, at least not very often. So that approach feels like kindness and charity and seems therefore to prove how good and saintly you are. But as he openly says, it's cruelty. For you become the quote, silent proof of guilt in them. When in fact, they need salvation from the pain of guilt. And so what's real, the, the, the real underlying story is not them, it's you. You have this drive for two things. You wanna be the saintly one, the good one, and you also want to be the living proof of their guilt. And that twofold drive is what makes people seek out the role of martyr, unconsciously put themselves in situations where they will be constantly mistreated. They want, so in other words, they get to complain about the boundaries being violated, but there's something in us that actually wants it. Right. And, you know, as the martyr, we don't complain so much to the person who's violating the boundaries because our whole thing is we can't be the saintly one unless we just take it silently. Okay. And, and our suffering is the witness to their guilt. Right. But we do suffer. So we do have the face of suffering and pain. And, and by having that silent face that we show them, we get to be the saintly one and send a message, you guilty sinner. And both of those, I think, are, you know, ego crack, right? I'm the good one and you're rotten and I'm the proof you're rotten. It's like our ego is just exulting in that. And as the martyr, you think, you just think, oh, this is hard. I'm bearing up. I'm trying to be long suffering. The Bible says that. Um, you're not in touch with this genuinely dark underbelly. Yeah. And, and because we're not in touch with it, we can't change it. And so I, I, it's a really interesting uh, archetype, the mar martyr, to have in a discussion on boundaries because so many of us play the martyr but don't realize that's what we're doing. We don't realize, we, we constantly complain that our boundaries are being violated while at the same time, we don't see the way in which we're allowing that to happen to send a message to the other person that it's because of you that I am so long suffering. And, right. and so we don't see that we're doing that. And we also don't see the way in which we set the situation up to do that so that we can say to the other person, behold me, brother, at your hand, I die. And we, we didn't get into this yesterday, but we've certainly gotten into it in, in classes and whatnot on this idea that we do that in part, we be the martyr, the long suffering one, because we want to kind of chain the other person to us through guilt and obligation. So if we say to them, it's because of your violation of my boundaries that I'm this way, we secretly like that because it makes the other person stay. Yeah, yeah. And I think even more basic, there is the ego just loves to convict them of guilt. 
And yeah, there are certain, you know, further ends that are met by doing that. Like they stay, they do our bidding. Um, but the ego just loves hanging people. <laughs> and I think how this relates to boundaries, obviously, is the martyr is somebody who seems to have poor boundaries, but then they are especially vulnerable to switching into the aggressive boundary setter that we've been basically referencing throughout this conversation. Yeah. You said the thing that I meant. It's not only that they stay, it's that they behave in the way that we want them to behave. And so the martyr is a form of control of the other person. It is, but it's a terrible form of control. Well, yeah, I'm not advocating for it. What I mean is it doesn't work. Like a lot of other forms of control work better to control people. Like martyrs typically just get mistreated and mistreated and mistreated and mistreated, hoping that people pick up on that silent face of suffering and pain and feel suitably guilty, but they never do and they never start behaving. So I think the, for the martyr, it's clear that something in them makes this deal like, okay, I know you're gonna keep doing it, but it's enough that I know I'm the good one and we know you're the bad one. <laughs> I'm sorry to be laughing, but it's just, <laughs> it's, it's everywhere. And it's everywhere. Yeah. It's amazing. The course's insight is so brilliant because it, he just in a couple sentences, like lifts the hood on our psyche and points out these things that in hindsight seem very obvious, but yet when you're doing them, you don't understand, you don't get it. Well, you could really see the whole contemporary focus on boundaries as as the solution to being the martyr, right? Mm -hmm. You've been the martyr, here's the solution. But if they had the course's diagnosis of what's going on with the martyr, which is really kind of dark, then aggressively setting boundaries would not be the solution. Yeah, because there's an element of boundaries that is I've been treated poorly and you're not going to treat me that way ever again, or I, I, whether it's the no one's going to treat me that way ever again. And so I'm going to set these boundaries in my life and I'm going to be warrior-like with them in order to right. maintain my self-respect and my peace and, and whatnot. And, and what if what's really going on underneath it, not in every case, obviously, but what if what's going on underneath is, is playing the martyr? Well, yeah, although I think with the boundary setting, you're basically saying I'm resigning from playing the martyr I'm not going to just show you this face of suffering and pain. I'm going to vocally protect myself from you, let you know you're the bad guy. I think it's the, the boundary setting is not the martyr. It's, it's, it's framed as the solution to the martyr. But we, we, just, we just talked about how we set the situation up to make it fail. And so we can set up a boundary situation, play the martyr, and oops, it failed. And then we get to say, see... I'm still the innocent good one and you're still guilty. Yeah, well, I think that's clearly, I think that's the underlying picture with the boundary setting and with the martyr who doesn't set boundaries. So this is so good. I feel like we could sit in an hour about this, but um, what, what a great teaching a series of teachings that the course has as I mentioned in the introduction we didn't know what the course was going to say on this topic yeah. and yet here we have these four examples we did get through the four well done you we did it and and they're so different they're but different there are some commonalities right yeah but there's commonalities there and they speak to real situations in our life and they're so broadly applicable and so robert thank you so much for for all the work that you've done to compile these stories and to interpret them and pull the lessons out of them for us all they are priceless they're absolutely priceless i mean yeah, yeah. You know, everyone has those situations, but with Jesus's interpretation of them, it just takes the topic to a new level. Yeah. And one thing, one commonality in all of them is, is there is a loving approach there. It's, and, and, and then yeah. it's an extension versus that protection we talked about. It's not about you protecting yourself. Right. You know, it is in part about letting Jesus protect you. 
And it is also about what you're doing being for them. Yeah. And it's about looking at the disease in you that is under the surface. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll have to leave it there because we yeah. are out of time. We're out of time. But uh, thank you once again. And we'll see you next time, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye for now.